So this is part three of four sermons that uh, I've been giving. Um, part four will occur next week so we can finish that before Passover. This is the third and final of the offerings that the God describes as that sweet smelling aroma. So you'll remember we, we've been talking about the, you know, that, that God describes these as that, that smell that he breathes in and just has this amazing effect on him, you know, a, a relaxing, a calming, a peaceful effect on, on God. We talked in the first sermon of this series uh, on the burn offering about how that burn offering required an entire life to be given and burnt. It represented an entire life being given to God, typifying the entire life of Jesus Christ that he gave willingly as a free will offering to God, meeting perfectly that first great commandment to love God with all of his heart, with all of his mind, with all of his soul, and with all of his strength. We looked at various symbols associated with that burnt offering in the sermon. In the second sermon, we went to the second chapter of Leviticus, where the grain offering is discussed. And in that sermon, we talked about how in that offering, no life was given, but instead the work one's life. So in that way, you know, as they raised, uh, you know, grains and they grew and worked on them day after day, and then they gave the, that grain uh, first and foremost to God, and he took his memorial portion burned on the altar. And then the back majority of that grain offering we looked at went to the priest and the priest's family. And we then went through all the various symbols of the types of unleavened bread that God used there uh, and showed how they, they pictured all these different aspects of our Lord Savior Jesus Christ, how he was that bruised and crushed grain, how he was pierced, how uh, Jesus Christ, uh, let's look, let me get back to notes. I know it's in here. Who broke my notes is what he just said. You're right. Who broke my notes? Well, I have no idea what they went. So that's all right. We'll just keep talking. So we saw that he represented that bruising, crushed grain, the pierced grain. We also looked at how he was broken as our Passover bread. We also looked at um, how he was wounded for our transgressions. And we speculated about the covered pan and how that represented him being uh, buried in the tomb. And then the new uh, grains uh, that represented the first fruit being the resurrection of Christ. And we went through uh, those various symbols. There's one aspect of it that I wanted to go back to and just make sure was clear because I think this part can be a little difficult. So when we say that the grain offering, just like the burn offering, represented the first great commandment, the second grain offering represented the second great commandment, which is to love our neighbor as ourselves. But when we look at how Jesus Christ gave outward, but that, but that grain offering only went to the priests and their family. And I wanted to circle back on that because some, some may question, well, how does the priest and his family represent loving my neighbor? How, did, how does, since it didn't go to all of Israel, how does just that grain off, uh, aspect going to the priest and his family represent all of Israel? And I wanted to just hit that again real quickly. In the Old Testament, well, let me, let me even step back before that. The priesthood was put into their position as a mediator between God and all of Israel. They were God's representative to serve in that function. But the priesthood was always a type of the entire nation of Israel. And we, we see that in the Old Testament where, and we looked at those scriptures in the grain offering sermon, so I won't go back to them today, but we see where they were called a holy nation and they were called to be a kingdom of priests. And in that sense, they were meant to serve to the entire world as a type of priesthood. And so then when we go into the New Testament, we saw how Peter described that as well for the church of God's day, where we're also called a royal 
uh, priesthood and a holy nation, a special people, where we as a church, as Christians, as those who have taken on that name of Christ, are meant to be a type of priesthood to the entire world, where our lives show what a Christian's really supposed to be, how God's way works, how it brings peace, and we are a type of priesthood. We also then need to make sure we understand that Jesus Christ is the great, so when that grain was, so to speak, given to the priest, who's the greatest type of the priesthood? Well, it's Jesus Christ. We recognize that from Hebrews. And so who is Christ's family that also gets the eat of, of the good works of one's life? Well, the church is God's family. We're, you know, we're God's family. He, he calls that uh, us his family even now. So when we talk about how that fulfilled loving our neighbor, I wanted to just make sure that you understand that when we do good works, uh, first and foremost, it says um, to the household of faith, but to all people, uh, we really are extending that love the way that that second grain offering was meant to be uh, a type. Does that make sense? Let me pause. <laughs> My wife is going now. Um, so uh, we can talk about it later. Um, so in that sense, Jesus Christ completed the first great commandment. He completed the second great commandment through the burn offering, grain offering being a type of how he lived his life, first and foremost to God entirely, and then second of all to his neighbor as himself. So today in this third sermon of the series, I want peace offering. The, uh, it's the last of the three sweet smelling offerings, and this is the peace offering. So as I've tried to do in the last several messages to organize uh, our thoughts by sections, I'm calling section one, what is peace? What is peace? Because we often in our world, they'll use peace if, if two nations aren't fighting each other, they say, well, they're at peace. They, you know, if, if in a relationship, you know, they're, they're not always arguing and have contention, well, that relationship has peace. But that's not what the Hebrew word, or at, at least isn't full enough for what the Hebrew word for peace means. When we look at that word, and you've probably heard phrase, uh, words that are all connected kind of to this idea. How many of you have heard someone say Shabbat Shalom before, right? Well, that word Shalom is one of the many connected adjectives, nouns, verbs that all come off of the same word for peace. And when we look at that, that word that's used there, uh, whether it's shalom or one of the variations of that, that word, we find that it's, it's a, a deep word. It's a word that contains a lot of depth and meaning that we, we must understand because if we only think of peace and the idea of like an absence of fighting, we're missing really the, a lot of the picture. When we look at the meaning of this word, it contains completeness, of soundness, of wholeness, but also in relationships of well being, friendship, companionship, oneness, and unity. I'm going to say those again because I want to make sure we kind of start wrapping our brain around this idea of peace completeness, soundness, wholeness, well being. Friendship, companionship, oneness, and unity. In the past two sermon series, uh, in this series, burn offering and grain offering, I spent an enormous amount of uh, the time on those messages, diving into all the specific symbols that were there. And, and I think that was important in um, those messages because a lot of symbols are used. In this sermon, I want to make sure we capture the vision first and foremost. We'll get into some symbols and some of the specifics about the peace offering, but I want to take us back. And this actually plays really well off of last week's sermon uh, that Mr. Karamidjian gave on that path that was made between the two God beings before time even began. So I want you to go back and I want you to think about and envision two God beings existing before time began in perfect unity and oneness. There was companionship, there was completeness. Uh, they existed in what we would call perfect peace in the fullness of what that word means. 
Now, these two God beings decide, as we heard in the sermonette uh, today, to replicate themselves. An idea that still boggles our minds that God's, that the two God beings said, I want to create from human beings more God beings for our family that will be just like us. And so they created as part of this perfect plan, they created human beings. And they created these human beings with creativity and emotions and the ability to understand, ability to explore. And these first two human beings lived in a garden and they were also at peace. They had companionship, needs met, but like us, they also had something else called free will. And we heard again about that even last week a little bit, that they had free will. And within that free will, they chose to, just like all the rest of us have done. And then sin and disobedience became a habit for mankind. And all of a sudden, peace was shattered. Relationships now had strife and problems. People began oppressing other people and hurting other people and stealing from other people, even killing other people. Marriage covenants were broken. Oneness shattered. Peace was shattered. So God began working within families, showing them the right way to treat each other, the right way to treat him first and foremost. God gave them laws for ways that would result in good things in their life you know things that were healthy for them and he also gave them things to stay away from them and he worked with whole nations of families and promised blessings if they would obey and difficulty if they would not obey and even even as these families grew into an entire nation they still kept struggling with relationships struggling with each other and struggling to obey god it's important to understand that that sin and that disobedience broke oneness. It broke the relationships, it broke the peace, and it came at a high cost for all of mankind. Our sin caused all of us to have the penalty of having to die and to not be able to join that family that God and, and the two God beings wanted us to join. That's what the cost would have been had their plan not from the foundation of the world already considered the fact that it, within our nature, we were going to fall short. So the two God beings from the very beginning of the plan that they made had a, had a way for restoring peace. Now this plan had stages and different phases, but at its core, it required one of the God beings whose life was worth more than all the beings that they created to be free, free will, free deciding to give up his power and ability to be, become a man. And for that man to do what no man or woman has ever been able to do, to be able to completely and fully meet the first great commandment to love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, to live that aspect perfectly under the law, and also to love their neighbor in the way God had always hoped man could love each other and care for each other and give to each other. And he met that second great commandment under the law perfectly. So he lived a complete, perfect, sinless life. And he gave and he served mankind with patience day after day. He met perfectly the two great commandments. So he met that burnt offering as we already saw. He met the grain offering as we already saw. And what did that allow to happen for the very first time? That's what we're going to get to today. But yet, even as he served them, Mankind turned against him and they killed him. And he became that offering that he was always supposed to be, giving his life fully 
he pleads fully God. He gave everything to their plan and he paid the debt that each of us carried, the requirement that we die for our sins. He took that debt on to himself to keep us from having to pay the penalty of being excluded from the family. So that debt was wiped out. And in doing so, he came all the offerings. And we're gonna go to next week to the sin and trespass offerings. That'll be how we finish this sermon series. But as he gave his life, became that sin and trespass offering, those two offerings, he became that burn offering, he became the grain offering, and he became the sin offering, or the peace offering, rather. And by doing so, he brought something back to the table that had been off the table, so to speak, peace. The opportunity for oneness, for fellowship, for a relationship with God, for the opportunity to join the God family, to be complete, to be perfect, to be safe. So through Jesus Christ, the perfect, complete offering, God could now again have what he desired, a relationship with mankind, have closeness. So that's what I want us to make sure we capture that vision today. That's what the peace offering is all about, restoring a relationship with God and mankind. So let's get into the details. So that in section one, I said, what is peace? Kind of painted that vision. In section two, we're going to just quickly hit the similarities uh, so we don't skip over those. What similarities have we already seen? that exists in the peace offering that also existed that we've already talked about. Turn with me to Leviticus 3. So in Leviticus 3, right away in verse 1, we see something we've already looked at, that the offering had to be without blemish. We already talked about how that represents the perfect, sinless life of Jesus Christ. We also see the similarity that it has to be from the herd or the flock. We saw those two back in the burnt offering, um, those two sets of animals, whether, you know, uh, cows, ox, or sheep and goats. And... We also, throughout this chat, uh, chapter, we'll see that the uh, fat, picturing the vitality, well-being of the animal, belongs to God, was always burned on God's altar, a type of God's table that we talked about in the other sermons. And we see in verse 11, it says, the priest shall burn them on the altar as food, an offering made by fire to the Lord. I want you to notice that this fat that was burned on the a bronze altar to God. It's called his food. Keep that in mind as we kind of look and explore the rest of this uh, picture in the uh, peace offering. These offerings were God's food. We've also uh, we've already covered the symbolism of the burnt offering um, in the first, looking at the herd being a symbol of strength and, and enduring labor. We also looked at that of the flock, the sheep and the goats being symbols of meekness, harmless innocence, willing to follow. And both of those carry on here in the peace offering as pictures of Jesus Christ, characteristics that he had. So that's the similarities. I, we've already talked about those. I don't want to spend more time on that. Section three, what's different? What's different and unique about the uh, peace offering here that we'll see today? The biggest thing that makes the peace offering unique is who got to eat from it. Who got to enjoy the peace offering? Now, in this entire chapter of Leviticus 3, dealing with the peace offering, you will not find the answer to that question. In this uh, chapter, we will see that the fat went to God. He, he eats that portion as his portion, but it doesn't tell us what happens to any of the rest. To get that answer, we have to go over to Leviticus 7. So if you join me there now. And if you would start in verse 11, and kind of continue down through chapter 7, 11 all the way through the end, you're going to see 
a number of different aspects about the peace offering. In verse 11, it says, this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which he shall offer to the Lord. So again, it's given us the context that this is about peace offerings. So in addition to the animal portion of the sacrifice, it also required several forms of the grain offering to be given. You'll see that in verse 12. If he offers it for Thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the sacrifice of Thanksgiving unleavened cakes mixed with oil, unleavened wafers anointed with oil, or cakes of blended flour mixed with oil. We will uh, in the grain offering uh, sermon. But notice verse 13. Beside the cakes, as his offering, he shall offer leavened bread with the sacrifice of Thanksgiving of his peace offering. We're going to come back to that, but start keeping this idea of, wait a second. Why is there leavening introduced into this offering? So we're going to come back to that in a little bit. And then in verse 14, one of each types of these bread, including the leavened bread, um, uh, was given to the priest that did the job of sprinkling the blood. That, uh, and it calls that a heave offering. For those that don't know that motion, heave offering is motion that it is heaved up and then is brought back down. And what that is symbolizing is giving something to God that then God gives to whom he chooses. So uh, in that idea of what we see here is these breads were given to God, and God says, these go to the priests that sprinkled the blood. And he, he basically gives them uh, to the priests. So it was given to God, but God gives it to someone else. Um, in verse 14, it says, and from it, he shall offer one cake from each offering as a heave offering to the Lord. It shall belong to the priest who sprinkles the blood of the peace offering. Then in verse 15, the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offering for Thanksgiving shall be eaten the same day it is offered. He shall not leave any of it till morning. It still hasn't told us who's eating of this offering, but we're starting to see it gets eaten. But if the sacrifice of his offering is a vow or voluntary offering, we're going to come. There's three things that have just been named really quickly here that it can be given for Thanksgiving, that it can be given for a vow, or it can be given voluntarily. We'll come back to that. It shall be eaten the same day that he offers, uh, offers his sacrifice, but on the next day, the remainder of it may also be eaten, but the remainder of the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day must be burned with fire. Verse 18 of Leviticus 7. And if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offering is eaten at all on the third day, it shall not be accepted, nor shall, um, nor shall it be imputed to him. It shall be an abomination to him who offers it, and the person who eats of it shall bear guilt. Now, we started out this section by saying, who gets to eat from it? Verse 19 tells us, the flesh that touches any unclean thing shall not be eaten. It shall be burned with fire. And as for the clean flesh, all who are clean may eat of it. Notice that all who are clean may eat of it. We're going to come back again. We're, we're kind of laying some groundwork. We're going to come back to it. Verse 29, speak to the children of Israel saying, he who offers the sacrifice of his peace offering to the Lord shall bring his offering to the Lord from the sacrifice of his peace offering. His own hands shall bring the offering made by fire to the Lord. The fat with the breast he shall bring and the breast may be waved as a wave offering before the Lord. Now, I'm still a little unclear. I've seen it where they say it's waved uh, to the uh, altar and then kind of waved back. I've also seen people say it's waved back and forth. I'm unclear about it. What I know for sure is it's showing that it is kind of presented before God and God uh, is given the opportunity to accept the offering. And so that's, you know, at the uh, in its simplicity, that's what we understand a wave offering is 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 uh, what's happening with it. Um, verse thirty: so His own hands shall bring the offerings made by fire to the Lord. The fat with the breast he shall bring, and the breast may be waved as a wave offering before the Lord. And then in verse thirty-one, it says, "And the priest shall burn the fat on the altar, but the breast shall be Aaron's and his son." So this portion of the sacrifice is going to Aaron and his sons. And it says also the right thigh you shall give to the priest as a heave offering. Again, that motion going up to God and back down from the sacrifice of your peace offerings. 
he among the sons of Aaron who offers the blood of the peace offering and the fat shall have the right thigh as his portion. So we're seeing a couple of things be kind of divvied out among the priesthood so far. Uh, for the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the heave offering, I have taken from the children of Israel, from the sacrifices of their peace offerings, and I have given them to Aaron and his sons from the children of Israel by a statute forever. Very clearly, God says, I've taken these and I've given them basically to whom I will, but here it's Aaron and his sons. We, we've seen so far, God got his fat portion. He gets his first, always through the sacrifice, God goes first. Next, we see God gives uh, portions of the bread, you know, one of each loaf uh, to the priest that sprinkled the blood. We see the um, breast and the thigh go to Aaron and his sons. Um, now there's quite a bit of the offering left over. So who got to eat that? And again, everyone who was clean. Everyone who was clean was allowed to take part in eating this offering. This is really unique. And it, uh, from all the other offerings, this is the only offering that has this, uh, this uh, thing in common, uh, you know, unique aspect of this offering. Understand, you know, God gets his first portion, the priesthood representing in its ultimate fulfillment, Christ getting his portion and his family. And then we also see that all the people who are clean uh, can, can partake in this. And this is the feast. We're going to look at one example. There's multiple examples of, of this being a feast. Um, many say that this is the only time, really, that the Israelites would have ever eaten meat. The average Israelite, it wasn't like you had beef every day. Um, and when you think about that, think about the fact that we take refrigeration for granted. We can kill something. We can put it in our deep freeze. And I can have a cow in my deep freeze for a long time and, and eat off of it. That didn't happen back here. You killed a cow, you had to eat it within a couple of days. And it before that, uh, after that, it's going to spoil and go uh, bad. And so God said, you got a couple you can eat on this offering and you can share it with everybody. And, and so to get rid of that much meat, yeah, you better invite everybody. You are even allowed to go out and, you know, give it to the poor and, and share it. If, if you were clean, you were allowed to share this with your friends, your family. This, this is a feast. Um, let's look at one example in first and verse 62. First Kings 8 and verse 62. This is, I think, the greatest example of the peace offerings that I, I know about in the, uh, the Bible. Look at this peace offering. In verse 62 of First Kings 8, it says, Then the king, and this being Solomon, this a little bit of background here. Solomon has completed the temple to God. The Ark of the Covenant's been brought in. The temple's been dedicated. Solomon has prayed. And then it, we come to here in verse uh, 62. Then the king and all of Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord. And what sacrifice did Solomon offer at this amazing moment? Verse 63. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered to the Lord. Notice how, how many animals. 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all of the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. On the same day, the king consecrated. Okay, so before we read this next verse, remember what happens when you want to offer it to be burned on the altar, right? That set aside as a table to God to consume the offerings. Uh, the burnt, the grain, and, and uh, the fat of the peace offering. What? In this case, they've killed so many animals. How, how long would it take you to burn 22,000 uh, bulls and 120,000 sheep on one burnt off, uh, bronze altar um, that, you know, roughly this big? It would take forever. So Solomon does something really unique here, and he dedicates and sets aside the whole area in front of the uh, tabernacle here 
um, the whole what they call the middle court. Um, and it's all he would have had to go through a process of setting that side at holy and there would have been a whole process that went along with that. Otherwise, you couldn't offer anything holy to God there. Um, but verse 64, and on the same day, the king consecrated the middle court that was in front of the house of the Lord. And there he burnt, he offered, notice, burnt offerings, grain offerings, and the fat of the peace offerings, because the bronze altar that was before the Lord was too small to receive the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the fat of the peace offering. Yeah, I'd say it's too small. Um, there was just no way they were going to consume that many uh, animals on that offering in any short amount of time. All right, verse 65, and at that time, Solomon held a great, or held a feast, I added great, held a feast, and all Israel with him, so all of Israel, a great assembly from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt before the Lord our God, seven days and seven more days, 14 days, which would mean they were killing animals, you know, on one day they were eating of it, killing animals, eating of it, killing animals, eating of it. over 14 days this is taking place. Um, and everybody's having this feast. And on the eighth day, this would be day 15, he sent the people away and they blessed the king and went to their tents. Notice joyful and glad of heart for all the good the Lord had done for his servant David and for Israel, his people. Yeah, I imagine after 14 days of feasting, yeah, they were joyful and glad of heart. I think that's probably an understatement. But clearly we see all of Israel here, um, not just being together, but they're feasting together. They're uh, rejoicing. But it's notice who's there. Who's, who's partaking in this feast? God, Jesus Christ, the ultimate high priesthood, all the clean people of Israel, all feasting together. That's a beautiful picture that this peace offering is meant to, to, you know, to show us, this unity, this togetherness, this oneness, peace. Now, back in Leviticus 3, there were a couple points I skipped over. One of them was which animals could be sacrificed as part of the peace offering. I mentioned it could be uh, oxen or of the flock. What animal from the burn offering that we already saw was an acceptable burn offering is missing here? The doves, right? The turtle doves, the young pigeon isn't mentioned here. Why? Why is it all of a sudden not included? Well, think about it. This is Troy speculation. Think about it. This is supposed to be a feast. It's but you're supposed to be able to invite your family and friends. God gets his portion. They priesthood gets their portion. Everybody enjoys this together. Ah, off of a bird, a little. <laughs> that's not much of a feast, right? So it it didn't make sense in what this pictures to have that. What member that the. the the pigeons, the turtle doves, they, they, are, they were the poverty version. Um, not that there was anything wrong with being in poverty, but it was the low one that everybody basically could afford, right? Well, it does, it, in this one, this peace, this unity, this celebration, the poverty uh, kind of symbol is missing. And that makes sense when we think about the, the idea of ultimately pictures. Am I cutting out? I am. Okay. Let me move this around to see if this thing picks up. If if it continues to cut out, maybe an ask Cameron to back and I'll try to stay in foot. All right. Um, another unique characteristic of the peace offering was that it could be male or female. That again, back at the burn offering had to be a male animal. Why can this one be offered of a male or a female? Again, this is Troy's speculation but I'll try to back up my speculation with scripture. The peace offering made possible through the life of Jesus Christ pictures ultimately a time when true peace will be available to all who are clean. Well, when is that time? When will true peace be truly available? Well, it won't ever be while Satan is in play. Well, we, we know that there's a time period where he's put away, but that isn't the time of ultimate fulfillment of true peace. The time of true peace will be when Satan is forever out of the picture. Time of true peace is when there is no more sinful human mankind. 
when all that who remain are truly clean and pure and holy, when there's no more tears, when there's no more pain, and there's no more death. When is that? Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24. First Corinthians 15 and verse 24 says, then comes the end when he, being Jesus Christ, delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet, but when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who puts all things under him is accepted. I mean, God the Father isn't put under him, is what it's saying there. Verse 28, now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. This verse tells us clearly that the very last enemy that God will destroy is death. We see that again in Revelation 20 and 14, which we won't turn to today, but it talks about that the grave and death will be destroyed. It's the last thing when all death comes to an end. This is the time of peace that we all look forward to. In this time of peace, there will no longer be male and female or any other category that we as humans use to differentiate. They will just be spirit being. They will just be children of God. They will just be the family. Look in Galatians 3 and verse 26. Galatians 3 and verse 26. Here it says, for you are all sons, and this isn't meaning males, this is a word that could be also all children, and we see that in the context, that's what it's meaning. So children, you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male or nor female, and you could add all sorts of different distinctive categories there, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. For you are all one. Remember this word peace meant oneness, wholeness, completeness. This is the time of peace we look forward to. Now, if we go back to Leviticus 7, let's go back to Leviticus 7. You remember how we talked about the in verse 13 that there were 11 cakes that were offered we know that unleavened bread is a picture of the sinless life of jesus christ right that we we understand that so why leavening where else do we see leaven brought pentecost you will remember there in the wave sheep offering, Jesus Christ is waved 50 days before Pentecost, picturing the perfect life of Jesus Christ, the first of the first fruits. Day of Pentecost, two leavened loaves were brought, picturing the church of God. Because when God uses us as symbolism, he often will keep leavening in the picture, the picture that we're there, we're a part of it, we're in the group. Now, God doesn't still see us as leavened in the sense of, you know, once, once we are washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, our sins are taken away. But when he wants to show inclusiveness of us in the picture as part of that family, and, and we are often shown as leavened uh, bread. And that's what the symbolism is, is bringing back here, showing that, that God in his beauty of peace, his perfect plan, you have God getting his portion, you have the priest jesus christ getting his portion 
and you have the leavened cakes, us being able, all who are clean, remember all who are clean. So those leavened cakes aren't looked at as sinful cakes, but we, we just see that it, it makes sure we know clearly. Because if he used another type of unleavened bread, our conclusion would be, well, who's the unleavened bread? It's Jesus Christ. Here he clearly is bringing in a picture of sin to show this is us. Does that make sense? Okay, I hope, I hope it does. All right, so then, again, you know, all of us join together in perfect uh, peace. Then in verse 19 to 21, we again see that only those who are clean can take uh, part in eating of this peace offering. And it says in 19, the flesh that touches any unclean thing shall not be eaten. It shall be burned with fire. And as for the clean flesh, all who are clean may eat of it. But the person who eats the flesh of the sacrifice of the peace offering that belongs to the Lord while he is unclean, that person shall be cut off from his people. So while these 11 loaves here represented, again, mankind, sinful mankind, we, we see clearly that this isn't talking about those who would choose to somehow continue to walk in sin, practice sin, live a life of sin. This is, this is a picture of those who are clean. So those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, who have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, those who have dedicated their lives to no longer just you know, giving in to our sinful tendencies and nature and saying, well, that's just who I am. Uh, I'm just going to keep walking like this, but showing, no, these are the people who have dedicated themselves to the same thing that Jesus Christ already showed us in the burn offering and the grain offering, right? Giving ourselves wholly to God, or like our whole self to God, to the best of our human nature in that flawed way that we are, but you know, giving our life with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength to God. And then in the grain offering, loving our fellow uh, mankind to the very best of our ability. That's what these, these individuals who are clean, you know, are, are, this is how they're living their life, so to speak. Now, as we continue to um, look at uh, some of the other aspects of this offering, we see there's, uh, I'll quickly cover that there was three types of peace offerings. We already mentioned that before. One was uh, for Thanksgiving. You could bring a peace offering and have this feast with all of your friends and people and God and, and Jesus Christ because of something God had done for you in your life already. You're so thankful for God's blessings, that he, some blessing he poured out in your life that you decide, I want to bring a peace offering before God. So one was for Thanksgiving, for something God's already done that you want to offer a peace offering for. Another one was for a vow. This would be you saying, God, I, I desperately ask you to do this, and if you do this, I'm going to fulfill my vow by giving a peace offering. And throughout God's word, God says, if you, if you make a vow, you very well better keep that to me. And, and we could turn to the scriptures that show that. We won't take that time, but God expects us to keep vows that we make. He doesn't say you have to make them, but if you make one, you better keep your word to God. And so if you made a vow and that, God, you do this, I'll... I'll give this offering, you better bring that peace offering. And the last one was a voluntary offering. It wasn't for anything in particular that God, uh, you know, did for you in your life. It wasn't for any particular vow you made to God that, you know, he fulfilled. This was just because, God, you are so wonderful. I, I'm just in awe of who you are. I'm just so thankful to you, God. I just want to give a peace offering. I want to have this feast. I want to bring one of my cattle, and, and I want all of us to consume this, and you get your portion, God. I want to have this fellowship meal with you uh, out of my deep thankfulness. So those were the three types of peace offerings that someone could give. Now, I'll call this ne next section, section four, the pinnacle. The pinnacle. And what I mean by that is the peace offering was meant to be the pinnacle of the offerings. And we already kind of have seen that in what we've been talking about, but let me let me share a couple ways it's the pinnacle. One was when one of the ways that Hebrew writers could could organize something was to put the focus in the middle. So 
this is almost like what you know almost picture a mountain where you know you might have things on both sides but it leads to a point or when we maybe in the olympics when we have the gold medalist stand in the middle right and then you've got silver on one side bronze on the other but the focus is in the middle well in the bit book of leviticus the the writer inspired uh was inspired to put uh the peace offering right smack in the middle of the five offerings so you on one side you have the uh burn offering and the grain offering then you have the peace and then on the other balanced side you have the sin offering and the trespass offering so what what this is meant to teach us and people who study all this see oh there's this focus this is bringing here to the peace offering be being the pinnacle of of the five main offerings um there's also people who study this a lot and they actually see this all book of the Pentateuch, where you know, Genesis and Deuteronomy and Exodus and Leviticus, you know, they, they're all building, or I said Exodus and Leviticus, Genesis, tough, I better get it right, right? Genesis and Deuteronomy, and then Exodus and Numbers lead to the focus being on the book of Leviticus and, and the holiness and, and God's holiness there. And there are people in and they they bring all this to a kind of a point but um my point is there's this organization that the writers kind of use to show us what is the focus and and in the offering system the peace offering is the pinnacle another way we can kind of prove that is that it comes last in order now this is when all the offerings are given and we'll look at an example of that here in a moment the first offering to be given was the sin offering and the trespass offering uh, also. And then on top of that would be, and make sure I say this right, the sin and the trespass, which we'll look at next week, are not allowed to be burned on the altar to God because of what they picture. But the fat portions went to God and that, that was burned on the altar. On top of that, then went the burnt offering, the whole animal being given to God. On top of that went the grain offering portion that God, you know, remember they took out part of it and, and burned that on the altar. And then on top of that, the last thing was the peace offering. And we'll look at one example of that here in a second. But what that is showing, this would almost be like, I don't know, a trilogy, right? You've all seen a trilogy, I imagine, some movie where there's multiple movies that are all building to a point, right? Well, that last movie is the focus. It's like, it's taken us somewhere. We've been going on a ride. And when we finally get to the last one, that's how this peace offering is laid out. You can't get to the peace without the ride coming along, without sin being taken out of the way. We can't have peace with God. Without Jesus Christ being that perfect burn offering and the perfect, uh, you know, fulfilling the first great commandment, fulfilling the second great commandment um, and, and meeting the law, to to a T, can't have peace with God. But when those things were done, peace was possible. And that's what we get to here when we kind of look at, at this. And I'll, I'll just look at one scripture in Leviticus, Leviticus 9, 15, and 18, where we see this order clearly shown. And there's other scriptures we can look at as well. It says in Leviticus 9, 15, then he brought the people's offering and took the goat, which was the sin offering for the people, and killed it and offered it for sin, like the first one. And then he offered the burn offering, and he offered it according to the prescribed manner. Then he brought the grain offering and took a handful of it and burned it on the altar besides the burn offering, uh, burnt sacrifice of the morning. He also killed the bull and the ram as sacrifices of peace offerings, which were for the people, and Aaron's sons presented to him the blood, which he, he sprinkled all around the altar. So it's just a real click quick um showing the order of these offerings and how they were carried out and we see that in other places as well where one was burned upon top of the other again remembering that most of the burn and the trespass uh went outside the camp we'll talk about that next week but what i want you to clear clearly see here is is the order now yes i know trespass isn't listed here so there's only four offerings that may be a thought somebody had um that's because trespasses as we'll see next week are very specific they weren't done for a whole nation they were individual so it wouldn't fit in this particular uh setting but we'll we'll cover that next week i want us to just make sure as we 
get near Passover, one of the greatest goals that I had for this uh, sermon series was to help us appreciate Jesus Christ even more than we already did. And I think we all held him in a, you know, enormous esteem. We, we owe everything to Jesus Christ. But I think we can, we can appreciate even the magnitude and the fullness of the offering that he made for us through uh, what we're seeing here, what he made possible. Yes, taking away the penalty, the debt that each of us owed due to our sins, but also seeing how he made possible us being a part of the God family uh, again, being a part of that great family. So I'll end uh, with section five. We'll call this, what does this mean for us as Christians? What does the peace offering mean for us as Christians? You and I will never live in this world as human beings in a state of perfect peace. Just not possible. But we can still have an aspect even now of peace and jesus christ wanted us to have that if you turn with me we're going to hit a number of passover scriptures now john 14 verse 27 is where we'll begin last week in the sermon mr midian talked about oneness how jesus christ talked about returning to his glory when god you know, loved him before the foundation of world, when they were together, when they had this oneness. Jesus Christ wanted us to be able to experience some of that even now while we live uh, as human beings. In John 14, verse 27, he says, peace I live with, leave with you, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives uh, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. God does not want to live with anxiety and fear. Now, does all that go away just because of knowing that? No, it doesn't. But when we understand what God's plan is, we understand that God can take care of all human problems. I still have bills to pay, yes. I still have sickness and things that are going to be involved in my life. But the understanding of God's plan is supposed to make a difference each day in my life. And I've, I've sometimes, when the world seems like it's on the verge of falling apart, and we always kind of ebb and flow through those times of how imminent the return of Jesus. But there are times that I sit back and I go, if I didn't know God's plan, I'd be a worried mess. Because I'd be worried about my financial future. I'd be worried about... Uh, my, the health of my family, what's going to happen to us. But God gives us his peace. Jesus Christ says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Yes, there's going to be trouble. Yes, there's going to be problems. But I want you to trust me with it. And to the extent we can get good at that, to giving God our problems, to trusting him with our problems, trusting him with what's going on in the world, it is meant to have an impact on us where we can breathe a sigh of relief going, I don't know how this is all going to play out, but God's got it under control. And I trust God with it. In verse, in John 16 and verse 32, so moving back a, a couple more chapters, John 16, verse 32, he says, indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has now come that you will all be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the father is with me. Christ was never alone and we are never alone. We may sometimes feel the lack of physical companionship with us, but God and Jesus Christ are always with us. We can always have a relationship with them. We can always talk with them. And Christ made that possible. We have peace in him. And then in the next verse, in 33, he says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have trials. You're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Christ didn't promise you and I an easy life. And in fact, he promised that it's going to happen. But he says, you can have a different outlook than those that don't, don't have hope, those that don't know the plan. You can have joy, you can be cheerful, you can have peace, 
because you know this life isn't the end goal. This isn't what you're waking up each day living your life for. If, it, if this was the end goal, it's not that great. This isn't the end goal. Turn with me to Ephesians 2 and verse 12. One of the other goals I had for this sermon series was to help us see how much the wording of the offerings are everywhere in the Bible and also throughout the New Testament. That, you know, we see things like sweet smelling aromas and we see things like living sacrifices and we see these words that are meant to take us back to the offerings. And we'll see that in a little bit here in, in Ephesians and also the next scripture also. Because here in Ephesians, um, it's in verse 11 context is it, it's speaking to Gentiles, but it's, it's really talking to all of us how all of us were separated right we we didn't have closeness and togetherness with God the Father and Jesus Christ, there was something keeping us apart something that was causing a problem, and we didn't have oneness we didn't have peace. So i'm wanting you to notice the theme of separation and the draw toward peace so Ephesians 2:12 says that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That was our state. And he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Christ was the offering. Christ made it possible for us to be brought near. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from two, thus making peace all about Jesus Christ in his flesh, in his life, what he did was making it possible for us to have closeness, oneness, wholeness, togetherness, unity with God and himself and, and making two become one, making peace. Now, again, when it talks about, you know, uh, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, it's not saying the law was done away with. We know that's not true. We could turn to scriptures. I'll just quote a couple of, uh, to you. John 14, 21 says, he who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. That's Jesus Christ saying that. We have to keep his commandments for us to be able to say we love Jesus Christ. First John 3, 24 says, now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. Christ comes to live in the life of those who keeps his commandments. So if he's not saying, you know, the law is done away with, we can live however we want to, what is he saying here? He's saying you couldn't live your life in a way that allowed you to have peace. It's not possible. You couldn't have oneness with God and Jesus Christ. It's not possible. It's only possible because perfect offering, because of Jesus Christ, that is now back on the table. You can have peace. Go with me to Ephesians three or Ephesians two, verse sixteen through nineteen. We had a relationship problem, and through Christ, that relationship problem was fixed. Ephesians two sixteen, and that He might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. So again, this is twice we've seen this word enmity. There was a problem. We had this separation, this relationship issue, and Christ fixed it. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For though, through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Turn with me to Colossians 1 and verse 19.
again, we see this kind of same language here. Colossians 1, 19, and we'll read through 23. It says, for it pleased the Father that in him, again being Jesus Christ, all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and in enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. That's how God looks at you and me after we are baptized and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. We are holy, we are blameless, and we are above reproach as we continue to walk in this way. Doesn't Verse 23, we should read verse 23 because it doesn't say we can just continue to live because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We can just live however we want. Verse 23 says, if and indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard. We still have work to do. Paul tells us that we have to make sure to remain in the faith, to remain, uh, be grounded, to be unmovable. Yes, we will be imperfect in it. But yet we will never lose our commitment to this way of life, never stop repenting, never stop fighting the fight, never stop working diligently to overcome. So as we end this sermon, as we imitate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as both the burn offering and the grain offering, we also want to imitate him as the peace offering. Because the Bible has tons to say on peace. We'll just mention a few things real quick. As imitators of Christ, all of us should be known by peace in our life. Romans 12, 18 tells us, if it is possible, as much as depends on your neighbor, depends on, no, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. That scripture means so much to me because I can't control anyone else, right? I can't make so-and-so treat me nicely. I can't fix their side of the equation of a relationship. God doesn't ask me to. He says, as much as depends on me, live peaceably with all, all men. I have my part to play. I can do that. But outside of that, the other half of the equation isn't my responsibility. But what is my responsibility is making sure everything I can possibly do from the way I live my life, how I interact with people, to the looks I give them, to my body language, to everything that deals with peace, that I'm living peaceably with all mankind. And nobody can stand up at some point and go, yeah, Troy, Troy's rude. He treated me this way. And, you know, all. I think you get the point. Matthew 5, 9 tells us, blessed are the peacemakers, right? Not peacekeepers, not peace sustainers, ones who actually live their life in a way that generates peace. Peace wasn't there, but because of their actions and commitment to peace, peace is now created out of a lack of peace, you know, where peace wasn't there. I keep thinking about these scriptures. Where in my relationships have I, do I need to somehow create peace where it doesn't exist? And it says, for they will be called the sons of God, children of God. We're talking about the family of God. Those that want to be called the family of God have to be peacemakers. We know that if we would go to the fruits of the spirit in Galatians 5.22, it says one of the fruits that come from God's spirit existing in our lives after baptism is what? Peace, right? Peace is supposed to be something that grows in our life as a result of the spirit. Another scripture we can kind of similarly reference is James 3.18. James 3.18 says that the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Again, a connection to peacemakers, again, to fruit, the fruit of righteousness in our life is sown in peace by those who make peace. So in conclusion, brethren, 
In the beginning, there was peace. God created a plan where through the perfect life of his son, come at, coming as the perfect peace offering, would restore us to a place where we could have a relationship with God the Father. However, while we can experience aspects of peace, even now in our daily lives, we will by no means experience the fullness of peace as human beings. We look forward to the fulfillment of their plan when those who are clean, whether male or female, rich or poor, black or white, any other separating characteristic that the world has used to break peace, when those are all done away with, when they're just children of God, we will be able to feast together with God and Jesus Christ. That's the goal. Hebrews 12, 14 says, pursue peace with all people and holiness. And at the end of that verse says, without wit, no one will see the Lord. So I'm going to say that again. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. I think I can speak for everyone in the room. We all, and online, we all want to see the Lord. We want to be whole, complete, perfect. We want to experience unity and closeness, a oneness and a relationship like we've never experienced, to experience perfect peace in the family of God. Thank God that Jesus Christ was the perfect, sweet-smelling offering to bring us peace. 